Okay, so um, I'm very pleased to have um, Rama here with us today. Um, he's a student at uh, Georgia Tech uh, working with Devi Parikh. Um, and Devi and Dhruv, um, who many of you guys know, uh, have sort of pioneered this area of uh, vision and language. Um, and Rama's been a big part of that. Um, uh, maybe most notably, he invented the, uh, the CIDR evaluation metric, which has been widely used in this space. Um, and he's done a lot of other cool work in the space, which he's going to talk about, it, talk to us about today. So thanks, thanks a lot, Roma. Take it away. Thanks, Nain. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about connecting vision and language for interpretation, grounding, and imagination. Um, in recent years, there's been a lot of progress in artificial intelligence built on top of successes in learning deep representations. So, for example, with convolutional neural networks, we can learn hierarchies of features. Uh, uh, which are which which allow us to recognize objects such as uh, sunflowers. Uh, also, with recurrent neural networks, uh, we can model sequences and long-term dependencies in sequences. And so, uh, like these are sort of and modeling sequences tends to be useful for language and so on. So we've made a lot of progress in terms of learning uh, deep representations for uh, sequences and for images. And so. Uh, specifically in the computer vision community, uh, given an image, we are now able to do things such as classify into one out of a set of image, uh, a, a set of labels, uh, put a bounding box around an object of interest, uh, estimate the pose of people in images, uh, classify what kind of a scene we are looking at, and so on. And on the language side, we are able to read a sentence, uh, translate it from one language to another, answer questions about what we just read, uh, and summarize uh, things that we read into shorter sentences. right? And so given all of this progress, it's natural to ask the question, uh, how do we connect vision and language? And why do we want to do this? This is like important from a high level AI research perspective, because basically vision is sort of our window by which we observe the world. Uh, and language is our data structure for storing knowledge and communicating knowledge. Uh, and not only from an AI research perspective, but also from practical application standpoint, connecting vision and language is, Im is important. For example, you could imagine captioning an image with a sentence in order to help visually impaired users. Uh, obviously, image search is something that requires you to associate textual queries with images. Uh, and now with like machine learning becoming more and more in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, used in our everyday life, we would like to build uh, models which are able to explain their decisions, and language is one good modality in which we can construct explanation. And so in this talk specifically, uh, we're going to look at this high-level goal uh, from three perspectives. Uh, in the first part of the talk, we're going to talk about interpretation, which is basically this problem of talking about an image uh, by taking context into account. So for instance, based on whether you're looking at that airplane or that airplane in the context of another airplane image, uh, you would say different kinds of things uh, based on the context. Uh, in grounding, we're going to talk about how abstract concepts in text can be related to what they denote in the physical world and how we can use that for uh, various applications, such as uh, modeling common sense knowledge and so on. Uh, and finally, in imagination, we are going to <coughs> talk about the denotation or the set of or the meaning of a concept in terms of what the concept denotes in the physical world uh, and how we can build models that generate images for instance uh, that are at the right level of abstraction so for instance given a concept such as uh, uh, <coughs> neutral uh, you generate a set of images which denote that concept neutral uh, but if now i said something like uh, neutral and female, uh, then you should generate a uh, more uh, compact set of images. So how do you generate images that are appropriately diverse based on uh, the specificity of the concept? So uh, let's dive right into it. Uh, let's look at how we generate uh, sentences, how we can generate sentences for images that take context into account. And so just as a refresher, like image captioning is basically this problem where you have an input image and you'd like to say something like an airplane is flying in the sky. Uh, the context aware image captioning problem then is to say something uh, like a large passenger jet flying through a blue sky, which is discriminative of the target image relative to the distractor image. 
Uh, this is related to the notion of pragmatics, which studies how context affects the meaning of words. Uh, and by context agnostic, uh, so we would like to do this sort of context aware captioning in with context agnostic supervision. And by that, I mean given a target image, and let's say uh, we do not assume supervision that explains differences with various distractor images that we might be interested in. But instead, the training data that we are given is what you would be given for image captioning, which is an image with an associated caption. And now uh, we will see how to explicitly model context at inference time in order to induce discriminative behavior. So uh, more formally, the first task that we'll study is discriminative image captioning, where <clears throat> the task is to generate a caption that is referring to the target image relative to a distractor image. The second task we study is justification, where we'd like to answer the question, why is this image a black-throated blue wobbler and not a black and white wobbler, where the first class is a target class and the second class is the context or the distractor class. Here are some images from the distractor class which are just shown for illustration, but which are not available to the model uh, during training or at inference. Right, so... The distractors are not available, so what is available? Uh, the identity of the distractor class is available, but the distractor you mean in natural language. Uh, no, so like it's a it's a categorical. Uh, it's like we have. Uh, it's just the identity of that class, not natural so language. So we've already. So this is presupposing we got some classification of the world into yeah. thousands of different kinds of things, of which black and white warblers is one kind. Yeah. And so you want a caption that would distinguish it. You say, that class, make a caption that would distinguish it from that class? Yeah, so let's say oh, you think okay. that that image is a black and white, black-throated blue wobbler, and I think it's a black and white wobbler, and this task is asking me to explain to you why I think that image is the class that I think it is and not what you think it is. Oh, okay. So that's why we call it justification. Um, and this is uh, sort of relevant for like fine-grained categories where there might actually be confusion what on what that category is. So it would be a sentence uh, that would convince you, hopefully, that th the image belongs to the class that I believe it is. So this example, can you uh, I don't like so like for instance, uh, I don't know enough about birds to remember uh, what it was. But for instance, you would not want to say that it has a white belly because both the birds have a white belly. So if I explained it to you that this is this class and not the other one because it has a white belly you would not be convinced because you'd be like, hey, that, that other category also has a white belly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, cool. So given this task, uh, we can construct a simple uh, baseline model, which we can call a reasoning speaker, where really you're given this target and this context uh, image in this case. Uh, and what you can do is you can train a regular image captioning model that takes in an image and uh, spits out a sentence. And the output from uh, like sampled outputs from that first stage uh, can be fed into a re-ranker, which has access to both the target and the distracted images, which can try to re-rank which sentence uh, from the speaker seems more discriminative and produce select that as the output. So uh, more. Do you, do you know a lot about the world? I mean, do you know about big jets and little planes as part yes. of the knowledge base you start from? So uh, this and is assuming the images. It would be hard to. Generate so we assume that we have access to a large data set that contains images with paired sentences. And uh, the, br the, bla the brown box there has learned a mapping uh, on the a distribution over sentences given images. And we are saying that we can sample from uh, that. And then given a bunch of samples, uh, so that box is going to produce, let's say, we are going to sample from the uh, distribution on sentences given that input image. And then uh, given uh, multiple sentences that are sampled from that model, we can feed it to another system that's re-ranking these sentences to figure out which is more discriminative. Does that make sense? But the input data is a large set of images, each with a caption. Exactly. OK. Yeah. And given that uh, model, uh, we, can, we can use that model as a part of this reasoning speaker in order to do discriminative captioning where we, we sample at multiple utterances uh, from, like, uh, just given the image, I'm gonna say a bunch of things, and then someone else has the responsibility of picking out what seems more discriminative. And that is like the pink box there, which is a listener. You can think of this as the speaker, the other as a listener, yeah. So just to be very clear, so 
all those sentences exist already, and what your algorithm is doing is re-ranking them. But no. it is not generating new sentences, like the caption is not generated from scratch. Uh, the caption is generated from scratch, from uh, the first, the, from the first, uh, the brown box there is taking in the input image and generating captions. And whatever captions get generated by that brown box are being re-ranked by the pink box. Uh, so that's like, the yeah. So that so that that is a regular image captioning model, which is learning, which has been trained to estimate the distribution on sentences given an image. So we are sampling from that. So those are the sentences uh, that are sampled from pro uh, a model that has learned probability on sentences given images, and given those samples, there is a listener, which is a ranking model that can score a sentence and an image and assign and tell me how, how, how well they go together. And then I have to pick a sentence that maximizes the difference in the scores for the target image and the distractor. So some, I would like to find a sentence uh, that goes better with the target image and uh, goes worse with the distractor. So when you say distribution over all sentences, I mean, that's like an infinite space, right? Yeah. Could we maybe move on and take this Sorry. to the yeah. end? Fair point. Um, so, uh, given that we are doing this uh, sort of propose and re-rank kind of uh, pipeline where a, a, a captioning model is generating multiple utterances which are getting re-ranked by a listener, uh, the bottleneck here tends to be the proposal distribution. Uh, and basically, if you think about this as the distribution of utterances that you would have uh, within the context agnostic setting where you just, you're just talking about the image that you're given as input, and let's imagine this is the true discriminative sentence distribution that someone might have written as a human describing the difference between the target and the distractor. If, you, if there is not enough overlap between these two distributions, then you would need to draw a lot of samples for you to get a sample that's actually under the discriminative distribution. And so in this setting, basically the reasoning, in this reasoning speaker uh, sort of approach, the proposal distribution becomes crucial and it often becomes a bottleneck to performance. And so our proposed model is what we call as an introspective speaker, which uses the model's internal beliefs to assess the discriminativeness of utterances, as opposed to this external ranking model that I was uh, talking about on the previous slide. And so more concretely, while a generic explanation model might take as input an image and a target class and say something like white belly and breast, our model considers what happens when you condition, let's say, on the distractor class. So maybe you say something like white stripes on wings. And now at this point, you see that at the first time step, you're saying white given both the target and the distractor classes. And so perhaps a better thing to say is to say something more discriminative, such as blue. And we can operationalize this intuition by saying, let's try to pick a word that's more likely under the target class and less likely under the distractor class. Uh, so this is a term that judges how discriminative an utterance is. Uh, but on its own, that does not ensure that you get sentences that look like sentences. And so we mix that in with another term that says, find me a word that's highly likely under the target class. And so that ensures good sentences. And then we can mix uh, how much importance we give to each of these terms with a trade-off parameter, lambda, that tells you how discriminative versus generative you want to be when you select sentences. Uh, and we can continue this process across multiple time steps and say something like blue throat and wings. Uh, and which is more discriminative in this case, talking about the more salient features uh, in that image for the target class. And for evaluation, uh, we get these target and distractor classes by inducing a taxonomy over uh, a big data set with a bunch of bird categories. So for instance, we would have a hyper category like wobbler and different types of wobblers uh, would be under that, hype, uh, under that node. And so we would pick two of those uh, classes and then uh, go to humans and show them the image from the target class and a set of images from the distractor class and ask them to describe the target image so that they're saying something that's not confusing with respect to the set of distractor images. So we do this for 3,171 triplets of image, target class, and distractor class. And this basically gives us our data set that we use for evaluation purposes, right? So we train, hi. Quick question, do you do this only forward decoding or do you forward and backward decoding? Because if you uh, do only forward decoding, you would sort of bias the difference towards the beginning, or isn't it? Okay. Um, so actually, it just turns out that if you write down an objective that says, 
find uh, maximize the probability of a sentence given the target class divided by sentence given the distractor class. You can just factorize it into because the graphical model factorize. You can just like without any assumptions, you can just like. Uh, break that down into probability of a sentence given everything that came before it and it's like there are no assumptions yeah there are no additional assumptions happening here beyond what you do in regular captioning models yeah um, <clears throat> cool so coming to the results uh, so we saw in the previous slide that we collected this data set of ground truth sentences that were discriminative and so given that we can compare our outputs with respect to the reference human sentences to see how well we are doing. Uh, and so basically on the x-axis, what we are doing is we are sweeping between how discriminative and how generative the model is, is being used as. Uh, and we see that in the middle values uh, of this trade-off, we get good performance with our model. And we outperform baseline approaches, which do not use any image signal. Uh, the reasoning speaker baseline that I uh, in first introduced and regular max likelihood decoding, which is how you do approximate decoding in these uh, sequence models. And uh, here are some qualitative results. So here, let's say that you are given this target image and the distractor, which is a one nearest neighbor for this target image. Uh, a regular speaker, which just looks at the target image, would say something like a large passenger jet is sitting on an airport tarmac, which you can see probably refers to the distractor image better than the target image. Uh, our approach says something like many airplanes are lined up on a tarmac, which you can see is discriminative and refers to the target image. Um, and in, now, interestingly, if we took like a random image as a distractor and ran our approach on it, it says Virgin Virgin Airliners taxiing airplanes at terminal underpass. Uh, and so the reason why this happens is that we have this uh, log probability, uh, this log likelihood ratio term, uh, which we are using in the decoding. And now what happens is that if the two images are very different to each other, then uh, it's easy to select a word that maximizes this ratio by making that denominator go really uh, go down a lot. So pick a word that's very that's fairly unlikely even for the distractor image, but uh, it's so unlikely that when you look at this ratio, uh, overall the term just blows up, right? Uh, but so while this while this is like a this might look like a failure mode, you can easily circumvent this by saying that let's just back off to using a regular captioning model in the case where the two images are completely unrelated. Because just a regular caption would be sufficient to be discriminate, would be sufficiently discriminative uh, in, in this like random case. Uh, and so to summarize, uh, we proposed an introspective speaker uh, which picks utterances based on beliefs about discriminability. Uh, it explores the trade-off between how generative and how discriminative it is. We introduced two discriminative captioning tasks, justification and discriminative image captioning. And we found that our work outperforms prior work at creating such context-aware captions. So let's move on quickly. Uh, any questions on this part, though, before I move on to the second? Yeah. Uh, on so we picked it on a validation set. Uh, so we have the ground truth sentences that were actually discriminative captions from users, mm -hmm. and so we slept, swept for the right parameter lambda on that ground truth set. <coughs> cool. Um, and so in this first part of the talk, we talked about how like a speaker might modify utterances based on some belief about a listener. Uh, now instead, let's just look at grounding, which is this whole notion of like what, what, do words, what do words mean not to an external listener, but in the context of the world that we inhabit itself. Uh, and so in, co in the context of grounding, uh, we look at this problem of learning common sense, where common sense is the basic ability to perceive, understand, or judge things, which is shared or expected of nearly all people. And so what are the kinds of things that we are able to judge? Right? For, in, for example, if I showed you this image of a tree with an owl in it, uh, you wouldn't be surprised. But then if I showed you an image where there was an aircraft sitting inside the tree, you would be like, hey, that does not seem plausible. Or you would come back to me and say that that's a toy aircraft. Right? Uh, and so we're able to make all these kinds of judgments about plausibilities of various scenarios. And so in this work, we will look at formalizing this and studying this in, in, by, by defining the following common sense task, where you're given an assertion such as squirrel wants nuts, where squirrel is the primary object, wants is the relation, nuts is the secondary object, uh, and this is given as input. 
And as output, you'd like to really answer, does this happen in the real world? So given the input tuple, we'd like to output a plausibility score that tells us how plausible this is in the real world. And our methodology is given a novel assertion, PRS, uh, we are going to compute its similarity to things that we already know to be plausible. And the hypothesis is that if something is really similar to things that are plausible, then it is also probably likely plausible. Uh, and while <coughs> one baseline approach might be to learn such uh, assess, to learn to do such assessments from word statistics on the internet. Uh, this often turns out not to be sufficient because people only talk about things which are interesting to talk about uh, when we write things down. And unfortunately, a lot of common sense knowledge is fairly mundane and thus text alone might not be sufficient to learn common sense. Uh, and so going back to one, while one instantiation of what we know is things that we have read in the past, in this work, we argue that we should also consider the signal of things that we have seen in the past. Uh, and so what does it mean uh, to reason about what we have seen in, for abstract concepts such as wants, right? So here's an image of a squirrel that wants nuts. Uh, and you can see that there are a rich set of semantic features in the scene which, in, which, uh, which are entailed by the notion of wanting something. So there's the gaze and the pose and the expression of the squirrel and so on. Uh, but unfortunately, even despite like uh, progress, uh, a lot of progress in computer vision, it's not trivial to sort of understand what this abstract notion of wanting denotes in the physical world. And so we, we come to this realization that common sense is perhaps more in these semantic features and not as much in the literal pixels of the scene. So can we learn to some reason about abstract concepts such as wants uh, without necessarily resorting to photorealistic images? And so for this, we use these abstract scenes made from clip art objects uh, and see if we can use these for uh, learning common sense. Um, and so now let's get to the part where we talk about wh where these novel assertions that we want to determine the plausibility of come from. Uh, so <clears throat> there's the, uh, there's the common, common objects in context data set, which has a bunch of images with annotated sentences. Uh, and what we do is we run an information extraction tool on the sentences from this uh, data set uh, to get primary relation secondary tuples. So these would look like squirrel wants nuts. And then what we do is we take each relation and pair it with a random noun as the primary and the secondary object to sample a set of uh, likely implausible concepts. And then given these uh, uh, tuples that we extracted and this set of things that we randomly sampled, we go to humans and we ask them to rate uh, how likely, how, how, how plausible that concept seems to happen in the physical world. Uh, and so based on this, we have approximately 14,000 validation and test tuples uh, with the corresponding plausibility annotations, right? giving it a value from one to five, or are they kind of taking a set of 10 and ranking them in terms of plausibility? They're giving us a score uh, between one to five on how likely it is. Right. Yeah, and there are 10 annotators who are assessing each tuple. Uh, so we have 10, uh, yeah, judgments. Uh, and so <clears throat> now we come to the part where we compute, where we're looking at uh, how we build this sort of database of things that we have read and things that we have seen. And what we do is uh, we create, we, co we collect like a, a training corpus where we ask people given like relations that we would like to model. We ask them, for example, here to illustrate what the concept want means. And they're initialized with a seed scene and asked to modify it so that it contains the notion of wanting. Uh, and so a user can drag and drop objects. Uh, uh, they can add new objects to the scene and then uh, <coughs> basically then click on the objects uh, and tell us, which is the primary object that wants the secondary object, and also name what the identities of those primary and secondary objects are. So at the end of this process, we have annotations that describe which object in the scene wants the other object and what their names are. So this is our set of concepts that we have read and the concepts that we have seen in the past. And so now what we do is we compute similarity. Uh, so the actual part where we compute similarity between this novel tuple and the database of concepts that we collected in the previous slide is fairly simple. Uh, we use, uh, we, we project each word into an embedding space and then compute cosine similarity between the embedding for the primary relation and secondary objects, uh, secondary uh, words in the tuple. Uh, and so this textual similarity is basically computed using word to ec uh, 
Uh, and then for the text textual plus visual similarity, we use the actual annotations of the primary and secondary objects. And note that uh, because these are clip art objects, uh, vision is assumed to be solved. Uh, so we know exactly everything about the scene. And so we can uh, get fairly rich descriptors that capture the exact pose, location, orientation, relative location, and so on between these, uh, uh, between the primary and the secondary object. And based on that, we learn an embedding, uh, which is initialized from word to vec, which also captures this visual context. Uh, and so based on this, uh, based on predicting this visual context, we learn uh, visual text textual plus visual uh, similarity uh, and then use that uh, to compute uh, uh, use the same procedure to compute the similarity between the novel tuple and the set of scene tuples and so in terms of we evaluate by looking at average precision and so <laughs> basically we see that by if we use just the text alone from word to vec uh, we get to an average precision of 72.2 in terms of predicting plausibility uh, using text and vision, we get to 74.75. Uh, and if you use, let's say, half the data, so if you use only half of the concepts that we collected, uh, you can see that text doesn't degrade as much. It's getting to 71.78. So like, even with half the data, text fairly sort of saturated, but uh, vision is slightly lower than that. And so adding vision, adding the same number of visual examples is contributing more than adding textual examples. Text plus vision. Yeah. You just said that there isn't really much vision in this project, as you assume it to be solved. Yeah. So do you really mean text plus image? Yeah. Uh, or I guess one way to think about it is the if I so if I think about vision while while, while abstracting everything that's in the pixels, uh, the semantic sort of features in the visual signal, uh, and yeah, you could these are images. But there uh, is no Algorithm that looks at image and spits out the yeah, result. Yeah. Right? So it's yeah. kind of ground truth. Yeah, um, it is. So we are assuming that recognition is solved, and we are looking at what you can do with solved recognition. But I'd still argue that even from the point where recognition is solved, it would even from that point to relating it to language is still sure. vision. It's not non-visual, right? Yeah, yeah. How does vision alone perform? Uh, so for uh, so for this particular approach that I described, uh, vision alone uh, cannot really be operationalized in the model, but we have a baseline, another baseline approach where vision alone gets to 68.5 AP. Is that number comparable to these numbers? Not exactly, because it's not exactly a baseline in terms of the methodology. Uh, yeah. So I just really quickly, just these numbers, how are you computing them? Is it, I mean, how many experiments? How are you getting this level of? Because uh, like, if you if you get rid of the significant digits, like seventy four is seventy four. I mean, like, I'm just wondering where you're getting this um, yeah, level so, of precision. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so every tu we have fourteen thousand tuples, yeah. and for each tuple we have ten annotations, okay. right? Uh, and so that number of that difference that you're seeing between let's say one point like whatever seventy four point seventy five minus seventy two point two like two point five percent. Uh, that difference is computed over 14,000 tuples. Sure, but I'm saying, like, so, so the numbers themselves, though, I mean, did you train the model once? Did you train it 10 times? How many experiments are these coming from? I'm just curious, I'm just curious how, how reproducible this is. Um, so there isn't really much training happening in the model because uh, what we are learning are, like, the, I, I'm, I'm fairly sure that this is pretty reproducible because um, there isn't, so in, in the text only baseline, for instance, we are just training a, a word to vec, we're just using a pre trained word to vec embedding model, right? And so that is basically what, what there is. Uh, and then for the visual sim grounding part, uh, all our models are like linear uh, models, and there is no, there isn't much sort of variance uh, in the training, or like there isn't any sampling going on, which might like. Uh, give us a lot of variance in terms of how much, how often the model converges, or so on. Um, yeah. And so uh, here are some examples th that qualitatively capture what grounding is capturing. So, uh, for example, here we are showing the concept at the top, and there is a word cloud here where the size of the word denotes how prominent or how similar the visual signal is indicating that concept to be 
to the concept at the top. So for instance, for staring at, uh, we uh, using the visual signal, we are realizing that preparing to cut is similar to staring at, because when you're preparing to cut something, you're likely looking at the thing that you're gonna cut, right? And these are sort of dependencies or relations that are hard to capture using just text, text only uh, signals that just look at distributional similarity, like word to back, right? Um, and we've sort of uh, taken this idea and applied to other domains. So for example, you can learn orally grounded word embeddings where uh, if you have a concept like paper and leaf and you crush them, you get similar rustling sounds. And so can we learn embeddings that capture this similarity in the oral space uh, as opposed to the visual space uh, and so on. And so I'll quickly uh, go over the summary here. The, the basic idea was that we looked at grounding concepts into vision or into the audio signals, uh, and we showed that grounding into vision can improve uh, reasoning about common sense in a restricted sense that we defined. Um, and in general, learning such multimodal embeddings is useful for cross-modal retrieval where you're matching text to retrieve another modality. Right? And in general, this sort of uh, common sense uh, direction is interesting the, because you're taking um, uh, we have these abstract images which have uh, where vision is solved, and in a sense, the fact that we can do better at common sense reasoning it means that we are able to transfer the knowledge from abstract images to a real world application, which is common sense reasoning. Uh, so it's exciting from that perspective as well. And so let's move on to imagination, where uh, we'd like to model the visual instantiation of uh, symbols in language rep while respecting uh, coverage and compositionality. And so what do we mean by visually grounded imagination? If I speak a concept such as orange cat, and let's say you listen to this concept, maybe you imagine a cat which looks like this. Uh, some of you might imagine an orange cat looks different from this, but the key will be that uh, it will be correct, namely that the cat will be a cat and it will be orange. Now instead, if I just said cat without specifying the color, some of you might still imagine that orange cat, some of you might imagine this gray and white cat, some of you might imagine this white cat. And so what we want is coverage for this more abstract concept in terms of what we did not specify. And finally, if I said something like a purple cat, you should be able to imagine a purple cat even if you've never seen a purple cat before. And so that's the notion of compositionality. So together we call these three the three C's of visual imagination. Uh, and our work is going to look at how we can model uh, these three C's using, uh, how we can, can build generative models that capture these three C's. Uh, and so concretely, we uh, have this imagination task where we train with co images and attributes which look like, let's say, orange cat and images of uh, that concept, white cat and images of that concept, and so on. And at test time, we are going to ask the model to generate an image of an orange cat, which tests correctness of a concept that it has already seen before. Um, and then at test time, we are going to ask it to generate a concept like cat, which actually it has never seen in isolation. It has always seen it in combination with another, in conjunction with another color. And so that's going to test it for coverage. Uh, and if I ask you to generate uh, what a gray cat looks like, having never seen the com combination gray and cat before, that's the notion of compositionality. And uh, we are going to work with joint variational autoencoder models. Uh, we want joint models because they give us a way to represent uncertainty in a principled way, where you can simply condition on what you observe, marginalize out what you did not observe. Uh, and so if you wanted to do inference, uh, if you wanted to figure out the distribution on images given the concept cat, you would condition on cat, marginalize out all the colors, and get the distribution on images. Right? Uh, and we'd like to use VAEs because we would like to do representation learning, which is uh, a useful thing to do. And so um, uh, we're going to break this talk down into three parts. Uh, first, we're going to talk about what is a variational autoencoder. Uh, then we're going to look at objectives for uh, joint variational autoencoders. And we're going to look at a technical problem that arises when at test time you want to deal with concepts like cat, which on their own have never seen, been seen at training time, and figure out how to handle that. So what is a variational autoencoder? I'm going to skip through this section quickly. Uh, how many in the audience have heard or seen or familiar with a VAE? So that's almost everyone. Uh, I'm <laughs> okay, but this slide I'm going to still talk about, I guess. Uh, so the variational autoencoder is a latent variable model that assumes a unit Gaussian prior, uh, generally. 
uh, and then given that prior, it tries to explain observations, which might be images, right? And so this is the generative part of the model. So you have a prior and you have a conditional distribution on observations given, uh, sam given that latent variable. And then in these models, we would also like to go from images to figure out what the latent variable for that image is. And so that's called the process of doing inference. And so typically a variational autoencoder is trying to learn the inference and the generative model together. And it accomplishes it using an objective that's called, uh, that's a lower bound on the evidence given to the model, which looks like this. Uh, and basically, uh, in a world where you had cats and dogs, uh, what this objective is doing is, and given this prior, it's trying to embed the images into this latent space, uh, sample from that latent variable, uh, and then explain the images back. Uh, and then there is a KL regularizer term here, uh, which is basically trying to get, uh, trying to make the whatever inference you did to match the prior more and more as you keep training this objective. Uh, so that is what a variational autoencoder is, and that's what the elbow does, uh, the evidence lower bound does. Uh, and so now we're going to look at a, an extension of the VAE model to the joint case and objectives to train such joint VAEs. Uh, and so very simply, a joint variational autoencoder model is assuming this factorization, uh, which is implied by this graphical model. And all you have now is you have two modalities instead of one modality that we saw earlier. Uh, and one sensible thing to do is uh, for when you do inference to use all the modalities that you observe. So you take all images, all your uh, an image and the attribute, and you try to uh, infer what the latent variable should be. Uh, and then you can train this using the elbow that looks very similar to what we discussed on the previous slide, except that there is a term now that tries to explain uh, the attributes given the latent variables. So there is a log P of Y given Z term, which is trying to explain the evidence from the attribute space uh, instead of just explaining the evidence from the image space. Uh, and so the key here is that we also do scaling of this log likelihood term uh, to uh, weigh up the importance of log uh, P of I given Z, this is, uh, th and this turns out to be useful for uh, disentangling. Uh, and we can talk more about that offline if you're interested about what that means and uh, how that helps us learn this model. Uh, but essentially, now in this model family, we would like to learn a unimodal inference network, uh, where, which given an attribute can figure out what the latent variable should be. Because once you do that, uh, you, can, you can estimate the distribution on images given attributes by a Monte Carlo approximation, which basically first takes, uh, which first takes attributes and embeds them into the latent variable, samples from that, and then passes it through the generative model to figure out a distribution on images. Uh, and so what we'd like to do is to train this uh, sort of model family where you have uh, where you're able to do unimodal inference given any one of the two modalities. Uh, and so in practice, the way we end up doing this is that first assume that we have this, this model where you have an inference network that takes in both images and attributes uh, and, f uh, and you can train an elbow for this model. And then we're gonna freeze these parameters from what we learned in this stage. And in the second stage, uh, we are going to fit Q of Z given Y, which is a unimodal inference network by a process that we call retrofitting uh, because we are freezing the generative part and simply uh, finding what should be the right uh, inference net, uh, unimodal inference network. And so, and the way we do this is by maximizing this negative KL divergence between Q of Z given Y, which is a variational approximation to the true P of Z given Y, which is uh, assumed to be intractable. Uh, and so we show in our, our work that maximizing the scale divergence is the same as uh, this term below, where <clears throat> because we fixed the generative part of the model, the last term there is a constant. And so that's basically the same as maximizing the, uh, uh, maximizing the elbow for uh, just the attributes where, while keeping the generative part, which explains the attributes given the latent variable, fixed or constant, right? So maximizing this KL turns out to be just the same as, uh, uh, maximizing this negative KL turns out to be just the same as maximizing the elbow for attributes. And so that is exactly what we can do. We can sort of forget about the image part, uh, having learned uh, the P of Y given Z and you uh, fit a unimodal inference network by this retrofitting procedure. 
And in practice, our objective is called a triple elbow because we basically have a, an, an elbow term for like what you can conceptually think of as the first stage of training, which looks at both images and attributes, and uh, two other elbow terms which get added to train each of the unimodal inference networks. Uh, so one, I have that as a backup slide. Uh, yeah, but I, I guess I can get to it. Uh, I'll get to it uh, at the end, okay. Um, but basically, what happens is that the structure of the latent space gets distorted if you train all the three terms jointly. Um, um, yeah. How are you representing the attribute space? Is it uh, one-half vectors or a word of that again? Um, so, yeah, so I mean, there's a, there, these are like one-hot vectors which get embedded using a projection metric. So you can think of it as word to vec or one-hot, both are equivalent. Right. So all you have is one hot vector that gets multiplied by an embedding matrix. So. And it's a limited vocabulary, yes. colors and cat dog. Um, so this is, once I get to the results, you will see that it's not actually cats and dogs. This is all conceptually to explain it. Um, um, yeah. Any other questions? Um, and so, as I, as I discussed earlier, like all you want to do in order to do conditional generation in this model family is to have a way of uh, estimating Q of Z given Y. Uh, there are other approaches in the literature for doing this, namely uh, the JMVAE method, uh, which we find leads to better correctness than us, but poorer coverage. Uh, and this is something that we've established both empirically as well as uh, by like analyzing their objective. Uh, and the BIVCCA method, which both JMVA and our approach uniformly dominate, uh, which is more for like representation learning than for generating good samples. Uh, and so that's almost, it, it generates very blurry samples. And so for the purposes of this talk, we are gonna focus more on comparisons with JMVA. Uh, so before we get to the results, there's one crucial piece of the puzzle which is still missing, which is how do we handle missing attributes in amortized inference? So we are given at training, uh, if you recall, um, we are given concepts like white cat, right? Uh, and the way we are computing the posterior for white cat is we take white and we take cat, we feed that through a feed forward network, uh, which computes the mean and the variance uh, for the posterior. Right, uh, and now all, all this is great, this speeds up inference, uh, but now what happens if at test time I just ask you about the concept white? Uh, in a feed forward neural network, it has no, like, uh, there's no way that comes built in uh, to handle missingness or to handle the fact that the cat uh, attribute is not observed and like, it's not clear what you would feed, uh, like pass through this network and like how you would do inference. Uh, and similarly for the concept cat, it's not clear how you would do inference. Uh, and so, without getting into the details, what we do is essentially uh, a product of experts model in the latent space, where there is one expert for each of the attributes. So there's one expert for the concept white, one expect, expert for the concept cat. Uh, both these uh, experts estimate Gaussians in the latent uh, in the latent space, uh, and the posterior when you observe both white and cat is basically the product of these two uh, experts. Uh, that's not the full story. We need to do one more thing, uh, which is to multiply with the prior uh, to get this to work. Uh, but we can talk more about it offline uh, because that's a more technical detail. Uh, so this is how we deal with missing attributes uh, in order to do inference at test time with uh, just white or just cat. And now, once we have all of these pieces ready, we can we first look at the results on an affine MNIST dataset where. Uh, we we took the MNIST dataset and uh, did affine transformations of the digits and pasted them on a canvas. And so you can see that when we specify concepts such as big, bottom left, eight, counterclockwise, here are 10 samples that are generated from the model. And you can see that generally the model gets uh, the constraints that are imposed, right? So the samples generally are satisfying all the desiderata that the attributes are saying we would like to have. Uh, and now let's say we say that we don't care about the orientation of the digits. So counterclockwise versus not doesn't matter. Uh, then we can see that we get now a mixture of upright as well as counterclockwise digits, uh, which is nice. And now if I said I don't care what the identity of the digit is, so I don't care what digit it is, I just want something that's big in the bottom left, uh, 
we generate digits that look like these. These look like a mixture of threes, nines, sixes, and so on. Uh, you can see that one of the digits is actually not in the bottom left, and that's generally a trade-off that we find, that as you go to more and more abstract concepts, uh, it's hard to get very good correctness, uh, because all of these uh, we remember, like the, only the leaf node, uh, only the bottom level here is observed at training time. Everything above this is uh, these are novel novel things that the model never saw at training. Um, and if we compare at the top level of the hierarchy with the JMVAE method, we can see that JMVAE generally just gets like zeros and threes, uh, whereas our digits uh, that our model is generating tend to be more diverse. Uh, and this is backed up in terms of like actual metrics that we compute. Uh, and so if we look at the correctness numbers when only two attributes are specified, uh, we see that our approach is getting to better correctness and it's getting to better coverage. Uh, and, um, <laughs> and on a compositional split where the model is tested with novel combinations that it never saw at training time, uh, we find that the JMVA method actually gets better correctness on the compositional split. And as I explained earlier, that's something that we expect uh, this model family to do. Um, but it, it, it's generally not as good as us in terms of coverage. Um, so the, what we do is that um, uh, we draw 10, so I showed you 10 samples here, right? So we draw 10 samples from the model, uh, and then we feed each of the images through a classifier that's trained on actual images. Uh, and then what you can do is, you can look at the empirical distribution of the missing attributes among the 10 samples, and compute the Jensen-Shannon divergence between uh, that empirical distribution and the conditional distribution on the missing uh, attributes given the observed attributes from training, right? Uh, some, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, but something that matches like yeah. how much these distributions are matching, yeah. So if I understand correctly, the attributes here are sort of completely uh, orthogonal yes. aspects of the, the image, right? Like can you do it with, uh, for example, tags? Like people put on images, which could overlap with each other, yeah. and it could have mod, you know, varying number of tags. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. In fact, that's a good way to introduce like the next set of results, and that also I think leads to a limitation of our approach, which I'll talk about on, on this slide. Uh, so let's now let's look at some results on the celebrities with attributes dataset, which is a dataset which has images with associated attributes. And now you exactly have this issue where attributes are correlated, right? So uh, there are, these are not like exactly independent uh, attributes in a real world faces dataset. Uh, so, for example, so let's first look at what the model is doing in this, and then I can talk about a limitation uh, to make it scale better. Um, so, when all these attributes, uh, let's say bushy eyebrows, heavy makeup, smiling and female are present, you can see that both the JMVAE as well as the triple elbow method are generating reasonable looking images which sort of satisfy the constraints. And now if I say I don't care whether the image is of a male or a female, uh, you can see that triple elbow is generating a bunch of male images. So in this row, you can see that the fourth image, the sixth image, and like a bunch of images towards the end uh, are all like male images, whereas JMVAE is actually only generating one image that looks like a male. Uh, and obviously this is a cherry picked result, but in general this matches what we see uh, in general that JMVAE does not do as well at coverage as triple elbow does. Uh, while uh, these are exciting or interesting results, there is this issue that here I picked an attribute like male or female, which is which tend to be fairly orthogonal, uh, and these are cases where the model works, uh, but it does not work for cases like lipstick versus like male or female, lipstick and female, which might be correlated attributes, because one of the modeling assumptions that we are making uh, is actually going to break down. We are saying that we're going to take an expert for each of the, uh, so our fundamental assumption is that when we drop attributes, we get to a concept that's more generic, right? Uh, and so if I drop two attributes, I will strictly end up at a more generic concept than if I dropped one attribute, right? Uh, given that assumption, we have this product of experts model where uh, the less things you multiply, the less, uh, the more things you multiply, the more precise your posterior gets. Uh, but if two, two attributes are correlated, you are not going to as generic a concept. So if I drop an attribute that's highly correlated with one of the other attributes that's specified, versus if I drop an independent attribute, you're not going up the level of abstraction by the same amount. And so we need to model that somehow in the model. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Um, so that's exciting direction for future work. Um, um, and so to summarize, we propose new metrics for evaluating the three C's of visual imagination, con con consistency, coverage, and compositionality. And we looked at new objectives for uh, and inductive biases for training these joint VAE models. Uh, and our proposed model outperforms prior work in terms of coverage. And I'm excited about this line of work on imagination in general moving forward because I think it's uh, going by like uh, uh, the notion of using counterfactuals for reasoning. I think like having good coverage across uh, various concepts is a good property to have in order to produce good counterfactuals for what we might think of as reasoning. Uh, and some of the other, I've, I've done a few other things uh, during my PhD, which I could not get a chance to talk about in detail here. One of the things that I've done, uh, that we looked at is this idea, is this problem of like, how do you evaluate image captioning uh, models? So we looked at this image captioning task where you're given an input image, you are generating sentences. Uh, how do you actually go about matching a sentence that you generated with sentences that humans wrote? Uh, and so for this, we proposed a metric called CIDR, which tries to capture the consensus among multiple human captions. Uh, and it's something that is, uh, as, uh, is widely used as an Im image captioning evaluation metric and is available on the Coco captioning leaderboard. Uh, more recently, the CIDR metric has also been used for approaches which try to do policy gradient optimization of image captioning metrics. And people have found that the CIDR metric is a nice uh, reward to use for image captioning and leads to in nice uh, outputs. Mm -hmm. Um, I've also done some work on like uh, explaining the decisions of neural network models. So for instance, if you had a class image classification decision, so for this image, if I assigned a label tiger cat, uh, then uh, we proposed an approach called GradCam, which tries to localize which parts of the image were responsible for, were sensitive towards making the decision uh, tiger cat. So you can see this heat map here, which is indicating which part of the image uh, the, uh, roughly that the model uses as evidence to get to the concept white cat. Uh, I've also done work on like counting everyday objects in everyday scenes where you're given an input image and you'd like to have uh, train a model that uh, counts the number of instances of each of the objects present in this image. Uh, I've looked at this problem of like understanding from a fairly basic perspective, what's the, uh, less, uh, what's the relation between how memorable an object is and how semantically important? So for instance, on this, in this image on the left, if you had to describe that image, you'd probably say Mike and Jenny are playing. And so the, 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 the rugby ball there is sort of very important in terms of the semantic, uh, what, what sentence I would choose to describe that image with. Uh, now the question is, is such a semantically important object also a memorable object? So for instance, if I took that rugby ball and I dropped it from the scene, and then uh, I showed the same image to you with that rugby ball or without that rugby ball, would you notice that the rugby ball is missing and identify that this is actually a different scene, right? So how, mem how much does the uh, object contribute to the memorability of a scene versus the semantic importance of that object? And we did these studies using these, the Clipart uh, uh, data sets uh, because there you can easily drop objects uh, without affecting the rest of the image. Uh, and we found that indeed there's a strong correlation between semantically important and memorable objects. And so <laughs> coming to future work, uh, we've looked at uh, co the connection between vision and language. And in the future, I'm interested in modeling problems around vision and language, uh, extensions to how do, you, how do we do reasoning uh, and embodiment. Uh, so talking about modeling, uh, I'm, really, I'm really interested in this idea that concepts in language can be organized into a visual uh, semantic hierarchy. So at the top, you have something like dog, and then two dogs uh, running, all, and all the way at the bottom, you have something like two dogs running on grass. And as you keep going down this tree, you're going from a more generic to a more specific concept. And now if you look at uh, the denotation or what that two dogs running on grass means in the physical world, you can have, you can think of this set of images that all corresponds to two, two dogs running in grass. And now if I go back up this tree, you can think of this set of images becoming broader and broader, right? So uh, this concept hierarchy has a grounded uh, denotation, uh, which gets broader or uh, smaller based on, how, uh, based on how we traverse this hierarchy. And so I think it'll be really cool uh, to model vision and language in a principled way 
uh, which captures this sort of hierarchy. And really, the imagination step work is a first step towards do getting some of these things to work. Uh, and I think there's uh, a number of interesting approaches to be tried for this. First is to even think of language as a structured latent variable. Uh, where we sample a sentence and we explain the images that we observe given that latent variable. And can we even fit models that look like this? In general, this is a hard problem, but there's some initial work in summarization, which tries to learn summaries as a latent variable for observed text, uh, which is encouraging uh, and has some nice ideas to look at. Uh, and another natural model family is to use the kinds of joint models that we looked at in the imagination work uh, and see if we can uh, extend that to sentences, full sentence descriptions. Coming to reasoning, uh, I'm very interested in this idea of how, uh, of intuitive psychology, where basically we see agents perform actions and we anthropomorphize what they are doing in terms of like uh, high level in, uh, incentives or intuitions, right? So here we feel. Uh, we see this big triangle that's trying to attack this smaller triangle. It's been annoyed by the small triangle, uh, and that small circle is afraid. It's gone and hidden in like inside the box, and now at this point, uh, you can almost feel pity for that small triangle. That it's why is the big triangle so angry at the small triangle, right? So, uh, what we are able to do, and now you can imagine that like. Uh, abstract scenes, again, are an interesting text bed uh, to study some of these things about intentions. And uh, basically, if you see this image here and you look at this future scene where this lady sat down, you almost think, feel like saying that the lady sat down to watch the kitten play. Uh, and uh, once we can infer, given this action of sitting down and the context that she wanted to watch the kitten play, you can imagine being able to generalize or understand that the lady is probably in a relaxed mood. And given that uh, we understand that the lady is in a relaxed mood, there are other things, other actions that we can predict that the lady might be likely to do. Right, uh, and so this can be important for like computers to even understand or interact better with humans, or to generalize better, uh, given that they model this latent structure underlying actual observations. Uh, on the reasoning aspect, I'm also interested in this whole class of models for uh, reasoning using neural module networks, where uh, given a question such as, is there a red shape above a circle? Uh, there are approaches which assemble neural networks on the fly. Uh, based on some logical form uh, and uh, train these end to end uh, to figure out or to, to do question answering. One of the things I'm working on is like you, most of these approaches assume supervision for the plan in which different modules should be assembled. Uh, one of the things I'm working on is can we keep this nice inductive bias that there are sets of parameters which are fixed, which can be dynamically assembled and uh, lose the program supervision and still keep this nice inductive bias. Uh, I think it's interesting also from the perspective of Bayesian reason modeling, because uh, if you think about like modern uh, big neural networks, you are working in parameter spaces of like millions uh, and inferring distributions on all the parameters uh, in that space is very hard. Can we just instead infer distributions on plans to construct uh, to uh, route or uh, assemble smaller networks uh, to do some objective instead of working in the uh, entire parameter space. And in terms of embodiment, I'm interested uh, in learning disentangled representations by playing with the world. So disentangled representations uh, for this world, for instance, uh, if you disentangle shape from color, even though you never observe any data in the area near that question mark, you can figure out that that is a red triangle. And being able to learn such representations can help with generalization in this setting. Uh, there's a lot of work uh, going on uh, on like learning such disentangled representations. I'd like to do it by actively engaging or working with uh, manipulating objects in the world than working with static data sets to, acquire, to actively ac acquire uh, factors of variation. And so to summarize, uh, we looked at the three problems of interpretation, grounding, and imagination as sort of three steps towards uh, a richer understanding of how to connect vision with language. Uh, and we saw extensions of these lines of work to reasoning, modeling, and embodiment. And finally, uh, I'd like to thank all the awesome collaborators and like uh, people I've worked with across various projects. Uh, for all their help and support, and I'd like to thank you for being a patient audience.
we're already, we're already over time, so I think um, why don't we just end here? Um, and I think uh, most of, many of you are talking to him later, but uh, if you want, if you're not talking to him later and you want to talk to him, um, please join us for lunch. So, all right, thanks a lot for coming. Thanks. <coughs>